So I think we'll get started today. Um, so today's a Tuesday, so we won't be doing a lab. We'll do the lab on Thursday. Um, and so today we'll work on uh, some of the material and textbook and also the exercise uh, here. Just a couple announcements. Um, there's a National Society for Black Engineering Conference uh, convention coming up in Atlanta, and we have a student, a couple of students who want to go. Uh, so we have some funding available. Uh, we just want to see if there are any other students. Um, it, it's it, there is a section on uh, for IT or computer engineers there. Uh, so if you are interested in that, let me know. Uh, we have funding to pay for like registration and airfare, but students will have to cover the cost of their probably their food and lodging uh, here. So also um, week from tomorrow is community day. Uh, so if you are a first year student, I think you're doing community day with your yeah Dignitas group. Uh, if you're not a first year student, you're probably going to be sitting home bored and wondering what to do. And I have a solution uh, for you. Uh, I'm leading a small group to the makerspace uh, to just do some general cleaning. Makerspace is an um, organization in West Duluth that has a bunch of different um, tools, facilities, things, everything from, uh, you know, lapidary and pottery uh, uh, equipment to woodworking equipment. They have some cool computer-driven equipment, a computer-driven CNC machine, laser printers, 3, uh, 3D printers, I mean, laser cutters, and that sort of stuff. Uh, and we'll just be doing some cleaning and organizing there. I think we'll probably just work from 10 until noon and then have pizza while we're down there with the people that are there. So. If you're interested in that, just sign up. I just uh, like a couple people to go with me so I'm not doing it all by myself. So it's a good way to get involved. Uh, and uh, be, well, uh, so, okay. So that is uh, our announcements. I just opened up unit six. I just had noticed we hadn't have it there. Now we are going to be covering the first half of chapter five in the text up to this operating systems. And then next week we'll start with operating systems and talk <laughs> more about those. Um, today's more the low level stuff, like what has to be done to get the operating system kind of up and running. And we're gonna look at that in two ways. The textbook looks at it and the kind of old fashioned desktop computer way how do we boot up a computer? What's involved in the boot process? So we'll try. We'll start looking at that uh, here, and then we'll look at cloud-based computing. How do we set up a virtual machine in the cloud and get that booted up? Uh, an instance of that created and working, uh, because we'll start using those more often. So those are kind of our, our two things and that's how we're going to start bringing in cloud stuff into this and we're going to uh boot up cloud kind of stuff here um now i was going to usually on tuesday i just lecture on this so i was going to maybe you know we have bios uh we talk about device drivers here uh we still talk about the parallel port uh and pci and again if you're working with a bigger format computer whatever you know we still have pci devices and drivers out there uh and they talk about this uh again bios what bios is there's a new version of bios this uh unified extend uh, extension firmware interface the uefi uh which is kind of the new version of bios uh, which is more like kind of a programmable version of it. So we can talk about that. The whole boot process, how we find the master boot, where, where the operating system is, this master boot uh, record. Uh, and a lot of old people like me, even though we don't use the master boot re record anymore, still talk about it as if it were a master boot record. So it's good to know that terminology uh, here. Uh, and the new uh, way of 
you know, figuring out where on the operate, where in the uh, storage your operating system will be, and then how the boot process might actually work uh, for this. Um, now, this only talks about uh, booting. Uh, uh, you know, one thing we we'll also look at dual booting. A lot of times, we'll set up computers. In fact, we'll often set up, we'll look at our Raspberry Pi, and we can boot it. Right now, it's booting into Raspberry in a burner version of of Linux, which is a version of Unix, uh, set up just for the Raspberry Pi. But you can just boot a uh, standard Linux distribution, you, or you can install other operating systems on a Raspberry Pi uh, and dual boot them. Uh, and, and you can also set up your Windows machine or any you know hardware to dual boot. Uh, for example, there are times um, when we need, uh, I grab a laptop that to do some robotic stuff, we needed booting into Ubuntu, uh, a Linux uh, operating system. But we also sometimes like it booting into Windows, so we have it dual booting into both of those. Uh, and so you can set up most of these computers so they'll do boot. Now that's different. We'll also look at running emulating our virtual operating system inside another operating system in different ways of doing it. And there are ways of using what are called containers or Docker and stuff. So there are ways of doing that, you know, running uh, software like made for another operating system on your operating system in different ways. And we'll talk about that in future units, uh, but this just talks about low level, can we just boot up and run an operating system and then can we set it up to run so that we have some choice on which operating system we run. Have any of you used dual boot or have set up a machine to dual boot in the multiple operating systems? Don't see a lot of volunteers on so, Okay. Um, yeah, nowadays with like Docker and ways of running the software, it's not as common as it used to be. Now, rather than lecturing all this, uh, I decide we're going to do an activity instead of this. So, that involves you working and me not working. So we're gonna have you work uh, here. So go to unit six exercise, grab the directions uh, here. And the first part of this will be this answer image quote stuff. And that's what we're gonna work on here. Uh, we're going to uh, try to do this. Open up the answer image quote document and we'll work at And that'll cover all the material in this, uh, this first half of chapter five, excuse me, for us. Um, and then uh, we'll spend some time doing that. And then we'll spend some time working on trying to, again, do some virtual machines and booting up for some virtual machines here. Um, so um, I'm not sure how much of this we'll get to, how long all this will take. I certainly will will we'll get to part two here today. I'm not sure if we'll get to three or four. Uh, so we'll see. Hopefully, we'll, my hope is that we'll get at least to three uh, here. But we'll start at one. So open up one, go to this, and... Um, Um, why, where's my link to all of the people? Okay. There. So what I've done is assign people to different tasks uh, here. And so we have, how this is going to work is you're going to log in. So we have different topics here from the chapter. And for each topic, there's three things. 
There's some questions that you need to research the answer to. There's an image, you want to find an image that's somehow related to this, and then a quote that's somehow related to this. So like for BIOS, there's some questions related to BIOS uh, here that we can provide answers to, an image, and then a quote. And we want to have all three. And so we're going to divide and conquer. Uh, so we have a couple people assigned to each area here. And we want you to, so if you are assigned to one of these areas, we want you to find that. So like Taylor here is assigned to this BIOS quote uh, area. So Taylor will go down to BIOS, find a quote, click on the quote section, search for some quote related to BIOS and paste it in here uh, for that. So we want you to fill in all of these areas uh, for this. So find where your name is in here, uh, figure out, and most of you should be doing one image, one answer and one quote sort of idea here uh, for this. Okay, and then uh, there isn't a topic 10. Uh, so I'm gonna be reassigning those people to try to cover um, missing people. So we'll, we'll do that. So don't, don't worry about this bottom thing right yet. We'll reassign you once we get it. So find your name on these first nine topics, figure out what you're supposed to do and do that. Questions on this? All right. Feel free to use AI uh, to help with the research, Google this stuff, read the textbook on it, any of those things.
Okay, as we move along here, a couple things. Um, there are multiple people assigned to some of the images and quotes. So I'd like to see if we can two quotes or two images. So if there's one image there, try to find another image if you are both assigned to that uh, area. Um, also, uh, this topic 10 here, um, we don't have a topic 10. So if you are outlined in orange at the bottom, I want you to try to step up and volunteer for some of the one of the people who is uh, missing the day in, and they're highlighted in this purple, bluish purple color uh, there. So again, if you uh, run out of things to do, if you, again, if you're in orange there, just find some one of the missing areas and see if you can do work on that. Looks like we're getting some good content created. Now, last thing, at the end here, I'll go, we'll go around these topics and we'll ask one or two people in each area to tell us about the image or the quote or their, their answers to the questions or something like that. So we'll ask some of you about, you know, just to do a quick explanation of what you found. So just be ready to say a sentence or two about what you found or did uh, there. Um, okay, let's go through this. Uh, where are we? Um, so device drivers. So we got nice graphics here. Who did one of the graphics? Where'd you get the graphics from? So do the Google image. Okay, just Google image search. Uh, which one did you get? This one? Yeah. Right. I like that. I mean, it shows the device down here, the operating system, device driver. In between, that's really all, you know, that's the heart of this whole issue uh, here is it communicates uh, between the hardware device and the operating system for that. So that's a good uh, here, good view of this. So, all right, BIOS uh, stuff. Um, 
I like I said, labeled as bios uh, here. So um, how about someone who did one of the quotes? Where'd you get these quotes? I should ask you to cite these quotes uh, here uh, in the source. Uh, but where'd we get the quotes? Taylor or Kunda? Where'd you get the quote from? Or do you remember? Chat GPT. All right. Uh, here. So um, the BIOS is the silent guardian guiding each electrical pulse towards its digital destiny. Uh, gotta like that. So um, yeah, so the bio, I, I always have a hard time understanding uh, what BIOS is exactly. Um, it made more sense to me in the old days because in the old days, like of the old Apple computer, we had, I mean, it was actually, it was a chip and we programmed in and it was never changed. The BIOS was actually built in there and you can never change it uh, there. And it just helped, you know, where the basic instructions, how to boot up the computer today. Nowadays, if you have BIOS, uh, you know, and again, you're only having BIOS in the older computer, right? Your it's programmable, so you can upgrade the firmware of the BIOS there. So one of the issues with that is that if you can upgrade it, uh, people can hack it. And so there are ways uh, if you, you know that someone could rewrite the low-level BIOS on your computer, and that's not good uh, there. So. OK. Power on self-test. Uh, we have some good kind of views of when the power on self-test is running uh, here. Um, we got a quote from ChatGPT on it. Who provided this answer? Nick and Alex. One of you want to say something about that answer? Uh I got mine from ChatGPT. Uh -huh. This is just like the test that it runs when you're computing. Right. Uh, it, it was. It's just to make sure that uh, the hardware is not working correctly. Right. Yeah. And again, the common thing is that you know something goes on. You turn on your computer or your, or your laptop, and the screen doesn't come on. You, you, one of the first things you try to figure out is if it's getting to the. Is it getting to a power on self test? Is yeah. it getting that done? It, you know, it's usually the first thing. Can you hear what is starting up and what, how the results? And so again, results are communicated with different ways. Uh, sometimes there's an audio beep, you know, will, will or something will make some noise, you know, that it at least is, it's got enough so it's trying to boot up uh, here. Sometimes there's a visual indicator, like a little flashing light uh, on this. Uh, so. Uh, and then again, sometimes you can see, and if the light is is not on or flashing, again, different uh, systems will have different things you can detect uh, what is wrong with this. And this is, you know, this is on here, but this is actually pretty common in lots of other things. I don't know, like I always think of like a dishwasher or a furnace or things like that these days. If, you know, if your furnace goes off or is not booting up, uh, and most furnaces do boot up these days, um, there's usually a LED light that's blinking and or it's either on. So if it's on, you're good. You know, if the green light's on, if the red light's blinking, you just count how many, and there's an instruction manual where you Google it, oh, it's blinking red three times, what is that air? And it'll tell you the air and you can go up and look and figure out why you have no heat in your house. So. Okay, yeah, that's the power on self-test. How about UEFI? What is this like? Um, and how is it, you know, relate replacing BIOS uh, from this? So, who did the images here? Want someone want to talk about one of these images? Uh huh. Right. You just see how it's just uh, really showing just like uh, steps. Right. Yeah, and then this talks about also, you know, this BIOS 
we'll talk about the master boot re record here and the, and then this doesn't well be using that there so Dex, did you do this other image here? You got off Wikipedia? Yes. And again, this is what you see all the time. I mean, right? And what your problem, what I always think of when I go into BIOS mode is actually this um, nowadays, where again, you if you want to configure or do something with your computer, you boot it up and there's some way, you know, on F11 or hold down shift S or something to get you in BIOS mode. Uh, where you can configure this computer on what you want to boot from or things like that. I don't know if you've done that uh, very much, but again, it's it's pretty common when you're running into problems or uh, when you want to boot from something that's not your hard drive. Like I typically, like if I'm trying to fix a computer or a computer's not working, I'll want to make, have it boot from a, you know, I have a, I just have a flash drive with Windows on it, so I can plug it in and boot it from the flash drive. But again, you've got to often go into the BIOS and put move it up so that it will boot from the flash drive before the hard drive. And you can generally control all that from this sort of interface here. And again, all people like me will always still call this BIOS, even though it's not well, these days. Uh, master boot record. Um, I'm not going to go too much into this again. This this was really common on hard drives uh, to store where your operating system was booting from, but we're largely replaced it when we moved away from BIOS into this new one. So. You, you might still have old computers using it, but I you know not that many. So let's talk about this uh, partition table uh, here um, and what that is. Um, so Taylor, you did did you get this image here? So where'd you get that from? So that's just kind of showing you what that partition table's like. Do you remember or? Uh, okay, so but again, it's just storing at a low level some information about your where the operating system should be located, where should we be booting from uh, on your disk for this. Um, and again, if this gets corrupted at some point, then your your machine is not going to be able to boot up. Uh, so if that part, you know, if part of your hard drive or that drive or storage goes bad right here, you're just not going to be able to boot up. Uh, and so, but there are utilities that'll go in, they'll search your disk for the operating system or systems, find it, and they'll create a new partition table and they'll overwrite or move it or set it up. So there are ways of getting around this with the right tools. But again, if you know there's an error, you know, if you're all booting and if you can tell if it's this, uh, there are generally ways to uh, get around, you know, to fix this uh, stuff. So, and again, when, how would you get this booted or corrupted? You know, it's often when you're reading, like if you ever are booting up your computer and then drop while your computer's booting, drop your laptop on the floor, uh, the hard drive will often hit and scrape off, you know, have some problems and you might ruin just a little part of your hard drive. And it happens to be right when it's reading this, then you'll have trouble booting from then on uh, here. So um, let's talk about the GNU Grand Unified Boot Loader here. Um, Anyone who talked about that? So give me something about that. It's just a bootloader for Linux? Yeah, just a bootloader for Linux. Or Unix. Or, or yeah, Unix systems, uh, which, and again, if you are going to do some multiple, I think it supports multiple boots, doesn't it? I don't know. So uh, it, again, we'll loot it. Now, 
Oh, are you familiar with GNU? Uh, so this is a real common set of software uh, packages for Linux out there. Uh, and you'll see a lot of the low level tools in, in Unix world will be these GNU tools. So that's a common acronym. I don't even remember what it stands for anymore. Okay, let's talk about dual booting. Uh, how do we dual boot a Raspberry Pi for this? So, someone want to tell me anything about dual booting a Raspberry Pi? So I see we got stuff on here for what dual booting does, uh, but I don't think we have any links to the actual software. So next week, when we start looking at operating systems, we'll talk about some actual software that you can lo load in. And it's usually low. So usually what you have to do to get this to work, so like on a normal computer, you'd put it on your operating system or your disk. You'd load this on your disk where your boot image would go, and it would then uh, let you do it on your Raspberry Pi. We don't have a hard drive, right? All we have is a little SD card. That's our hard drive. So what we have to do is we have to do a low level format usually on our SD card that will load in a boot tool so that because the Raspberry Pi is going to look for a certain spot on your little flash drive, your little SD card for the where to boot from. And so it can point to some place that'll say boot from here, or it can go to one, a dual boot stuff. It'll bring up a little screen and let you pick from a couple operating systems and you can do that. So we'll talk more about that. I think it's, I'm trying to remember it's next week or the following. One of these uh, weeks we'll, we'll look at doing that uh, in, with our Raspberry Pis. Uh, and it's sort of like none of you are dual booting your Windows machines here. Uh, with like this. But one of the things you can look at is dual booting with Linux uh, for this so that you can boot your Windows machine also in Linux. Certainly if you're going into some a lot of so advanced tech stuff, knowing some Linux, Unix commands or environments would be very helpful. There's a lot of hard, you know, I call them more of the software shops, the development hardcore development shops, which only use Linux as their the development environment, don't use Windows at all. Their environment, especially on the West Coast, where if you're using Windows, you're like thought to be a noob, you know, and no one, you know, would be using Linux, you know, Windows. Uh, you would you use Linux and and do everything in Linux out there. So there are you know like companies like if you're going to be working at a Google or someplace like that, Microsoft you're going to be working with Windows generally because that's Microsoft. But anywhere else, you know, a lot of the other these uh, places like that, uh, Linux is. So it's a if you really want to work at some of those sorts of places, uh, it's nice to learn some Linux uh, and dual boot our system. Uh, for Linux. Although next week we'll also look at starting up and doing virtual machines in Linux, which is another fine solution to this. <laughs> okay, so you don't have to um, do anything to turn in anything for that. Um, I can see who's uh, here and has edited stuff for that. And anyone who's missing uh, today can go in before Sunday and edit or add some part of that. And so Sunday night, well, it's Sunday, Monday, sometime next week, I'll go through this and I can just see who's edited the software and version control. So as long as you've edited, touched this in some place, you'll be good uh, here. So that's the first part. Let's try to do some virtual machines here in the cloud. Now, you might be wondering why is he talking about this cloud stuff? So if you go to your favorite website for jobs, uh, 
sorry. So let's say I go to LinkedIn and look for jobs. And if I look for a skill, uh, a lot of time, there's a lot of jobs where you knowing how to set things up in the cloud are going to be important. So if I just search for AWS, Amazon Web Services, there'll be lots of jobs for that. So uh, there are a lot of places where like you're just working in data or something and all the data is in AWS. So they want you to be familiar with it. There's whole architecture design jobs, setting up cloud engineering AWS. Now, we're certainly not going to prepare you for that sort of stuff, but beginning uh, stuff here, a lot of developers will want you to have some basic AWS uh, stuff for, for Amazon, or if we search for Azure, which is Microsoft's version of this, we get similar, you know, 41,000 results, uh, and there's a lot of these architect, these jobs where you'll be setting up cloud environments and working with them. Uh, so there's a fair amount of jobs and they often pay as much as a software development kind of job uh, here. And sometimes if you don't want to do programming, but want a life to configure stuff, this is a good place to go. Sometimes I've seen our business analysts kind of concentration people go into this. If they want to be a little more technical uh, they can do this uh, stuff. Uh, so that's where we're trying to set you up here, uh, at least get you started down that path uh, here. So we are going to start with Microsoft Azure. So we're going to do this. Um, let's see here. We're going to set up a virtual machine in Azure here. Uh, so we're going to follow this lesson for this. Um, we're going to start here because uh, a couple things. It's easy to log in. You can just use your CSS login. Uh, so you, you should check to make sure you're logged in. I see this TG up here. It, it, I'm logged in uh, here. If you're not, you should probably just log, sign in. Then it will remember your status for this uh, stuff. And uh, this is a free environment we can use at Microsoft, and it has a good training uh, that explains things and sets it up and sets things up. So uh, we're going to create a virtual machine here. So it lays out our steps uh, for us. So we're just going to click on the introduction uh, for this, and it says we're supposed to spend three minutes on the introduction uh, here. We won't spend that. So again, talks about, um, gives you kind of some basic information of this and how you might want to use uh, a virtual machine. Uh, and again, we're just going to set up a virtual machine and it just gives us basically one of the things that also gives us access to is just the console, the environment for setting up and using cloud resources for this. Um, so, Mine's already done, uh, so I'm just going to go next up here. Uh, I think you will have a next down here. Uh, I'm not sure, but we're going to do next. Uh, so this will, and this is kind of common for these tutorials. We'll first walk through what we're going to do, and then the next screen will actually do it in their environment. And Microsoft will set up a simulated environment uh, for us, a sandbox to work with, uh, because if we were to do this for we, real, Microsoft would start charging us so much per day to have this set up. And if we forgot to take it down, Microsoft would continue to do it. I once set one of these up, up outside a sandbox, and then at the end of the month, I noticed on my credit card, I had a charge for a dollar forty-seven. I'm like, this is, why is Microsoft charging me a dollar forty-seven? Uh, and it took me a while to track down where, you know, they had said, you know, where it was, but I had set up one of these virtual machines and it was, you know, it, it's a certain charge every time it's used, whatever. And so I I was charged, well, the college was charged $1.47 throughout the month. So, okay. So, but we'll do it all in a sandbox so that you won't have to worry at all about getting charged. Uh, here. Okay, so we're going to uh, uh, create a virtual machine, sometimes, you know, uh, called a VM. 
and we're going to install different, there's different operating systems we can choose from. We're just going to install Windows because we know how to win, do Windows. We're going to do, now, Windows uh, on our computers in lab and your computer at home probably ones like Windows Home or Windows Professional, a user version of Windows uh, on a, on a, cloud-based computer where we're not logged in every day, we, there's a server version of Windows, which is very similar, just um, kind of optimized more for background uh, processes and things like that. So we'll be setting up a Windows server operating system on it uh, this week. And next week we'll do a Linux, we'll do Ubuntu uh, on one of these stuff. Uh, so we'll choose the operating system. When we do that, it'll allocate CPU, a memory resources, a virtual disk. Uh, it'll install the operating system and a bunch of the basic applications on the virtual disk. It'll set up a virtual network uh, so that we are our virtual machine will be on the internet and we'll assign a public IP address so we can run like a, a Windows, I mean a web server or anything else on this a uh, virtual machine so we can communicate to it. We'll get more in the networking stuff in a couple weeks when we do a unit on networking. So uh, we'll come back to this. So again, we choose the virtual machine. We have to choose the size. And we'll see this even more when we do this uh, other thing. So there are different sizes out there and these companies have the weirdest names for these sizes. So um, these are the Microsoft. So like, for general web computing, there's good old size B, size DSD3, or just DV3, or DV2. Uh, for heavy computing, you can do an F or an FS. Uh, data storage, you can do an LS. So there are these different storage options, uh, and we're not gonna go into too many of those at that time, but different configurations. Uh, amount of memory, amount of hard drive, amount of GPUs or whatever processing you need based on it. And again, some of them will cost a lot more. We'll only be able to choose one when we go through ours uh, stuff. Uh, then storage, how many virtual disks, the size of the disks that we wanna set up. So we'll, we can get to choose that. Again, we'll have limited choices in this lab. But again, if you're setting this up for real, you can choose that. Um, and again, if they, if you want to manage the disks, or if uh, you, if you want them to manage the disks, so we will have them manage the disks. They will set up the disk and install the operating systems and all the stuff there. You can set it up so that they're basically blank disks, and you can install your own formatted stuff to these disks uh, and set them up however you want them. And again, all this network stuff, and we're going to leave that as is uh, until later we talk about that. Okay, so now step three, we're going to do this in a sandbox. So the top should be, uh, so I'm in unit three of seven, the exercise, and there should be a sandbox. I wanna activate that sandbox. And that'll create a virtual kind of environment where we can do stuff and it'll go away. I think we have an hour to work on it and in an hour it'll go away. And it's so that way we won't get charged for any of this. Because if we were doing it outside the sandbox, again, we might get charged for this. So, um, why didn't I have permission? Okay, I had to click that review permissions. You might have to do that also, let's see if, it will do it now. So it is kind of creating a, a, a its own little environment. So usually what you do is like, if you're in a company, uh, you, we would, I have a login. We create different user accounts uh, for different people at our company. Uh, we'd have users in different groups. We'd have resources. We'd have a, a billing or we'd have uh, them tied and a billing system set up so that you can charge things uh, and set those up. Like I, 
outside of this, we have I have this for say, you know, some say it's classic and stuff. The IT department has a separate one as a big thing, but we just have in our department our own little one. But that's all being done for us here. So sandbox is activated. So were you able to get your sandbox activated here? Uh, for this. So that's what we want. We want to, and again, you may, if you get a permission issue, click on the review permissions. It should pop up a window and review those permissions uh, here. So, so again, we're, we've activated our sandbox here. We've then gone, opened up the portal. We're over here, we're logged in. And again, some of you had to do a login here. Not sure why, but you should be able to create a free login here. Um, and again, we uh, we should be able to select this standard, the small Windows server uh, here. Again, maybe that's under recently used. Maybe that's why. So uh, for this, okay. Now the username and password will enter. Let's see if they tell us. Um, okay, yeah, they just said enter what you want. So again, you might want to note this. You'll need to remember this. So I'm just going to type in uh, T Gibbons is my username and my password. I'm just going to give it a, I think I'll say T Gibbons, uh, one, two, three, four. I guess I need a... So do some passwords that you can remember. And again, you just have to remember for a few minutes. So just note it down somewhere. And you have to type it in twice. Now, we'll talk about connecting to this in a couple different ways. Uh, we will want certain ports available uh, here. And I would suggest uh, doing both Secure Shell and RDP. And we'll learn more about those on Thursday. But for the ports allowed, uh, we're just going to click and make sure these two are checked. Now, if we were going to set up a web server, we'd do the other ports, but we're not setting up any sort of web server there. And again, if you don't have those selected, don't worry about it uh, for this. Uh, so, and I'm going to go to the next page with this, the disks uh, here. Um. So the default image is 30 gig. And again, I'm going to go scroll down in my instructions uh, here. Uh, and there's different versions uh, for this. Um, we can just accept the defaults for all of these uh, things uh, for this. So it's going to create one hard drive, 30 gigs. Uh, on like an S SSD drive, it'll delete it when the virtual machine is deleted uh, for that. So now I'm gonna go to networking. And again, I'm not going to configure anything for the networking either. Uh, so all this stuff uh, we'll just leave as is. Here again, there'll be two ports that'll be configured here. Now, I could have actually stopped earlier and just hit review create, and that's what I usually do. After I finish that first screen, I just say review and create. But I just want to do scroll through this because again, they are doing some of this uh talking about this configuration stuff too. So again, they're not changing anything here. Uh the management stuff. Again, there'll be all these tabs on here. Uh, we'll, you know, and we're, we're just gonna accept all the defaults. So at this point, I'm just gonna say review and create. So 
Again, select review and create uh, for this. You're going to be charged 12 cents an hour if this wasn't in your sandbox uh, for this uh, stuff. So, um, and again, I have two ports open to the internet so that uh, for stuff and I would have to be careful of that. So now I'm going to hit, so I've reviewed everything that looks good and I hit create. And again, this, you won't get charged for this uh, because we're doing this in a sandbox. So now I'm just waiting for it to actually be student started up. It's going, it's booting up this virtual machine. It should be showing that here in my overview of this. And so mine is showing you. You eventually should see just one virtual machine. You see, you can see I've done this a number of different times, and so I have old virtual machines lying around that just aren't running. Uh, here um, for this. Um, and so and this is my one from the day that I created and it is still uh, up. Now I can hit refresh uh, to see how things are doing up at the top. Okay, while that is running it'll take a little bit for it to be all set up because it again has to configure network stuff get this all on the internet boot up the operating system all this it takes a while uh here uh for this i'm going to go back to my instructions here so i've done three the exercise three uh here uh for this i'm going to go on to the next one four we're going to connect up to this virtual machine using RDP. And again, what we'll do on Thursdays, we'll use a secure shell and RDP, RDP to talk, to connect up to our Raspberry Pi. So we'll look at this more, uh, but RDP is a remote desktop uh, protocol. And so we'll connect up to our machine uh, with this uh, stuff. So, um we'll do this uh so then i think that's four talks about so we'll run this uh on our computer here we'll open up this remote desktop connection we'll specify some things and it'll connect up and it'll connect us up to our remote machine and open up a window to that uh, here, so that'll be our connection. So we want this to be secure. So we'll look at some ways to make this very secure so other people can't connect up to this. So that's four, five should be the exercise to actually connect up. So in five, they'll check to make sure your sandbox is still active. I still have 41 minutes of my sandbox here. That's good. Um, I'm gonna connect up to the VM with my remote ProCup. So um, I have to download a configuration file from the VM uh, here. So I'm gonna go and do that. So hopefully over here, uh, my VM is running. If I click on overview, um, well, we should see our deployment is complete here. Um, and I wanna get resources. If you see a list of your uh, virtual machines and you see this running, click on it to uh, just look at this one overview of this one virtual machine. See if you can get to that spot. Determine whether your VM is run, as we've got here. Um, we want to get the public address uh, of this. Um, so yeah, oh, here's my VM. So I'm gonna, um, so uh, yeah, so we're going to try to connect to it. Uh, to, so let's see. 
Okay, yeah, this is the window I want to be at. Okay, so I've clicked on my VM. If I was here and I said deployment details, if it wasn't available, and clicked on my VM. So now this is my VM, my virtual machine. What I want to do is note some things like the public IP address. I'm going to write that down, or I'm just going to post paste that to Notepad. So I'm just going to note this address uh, that'll help me connect to this later on. And now I'm going to connect to it. Uh, so with that virtual machine, there should be a connect button at the top. So I'm just going to hit that and connect. It again shows me my public address for this, and I can then download this RDP file. So I'm going to download this file. This will be a configuration file. It's going to, in mine, going to save it to downloads. I'm going to save that. So again, I'm at the VM here. Uh, I hit the connect button and just said connect. It'll bring up this connect window. You can also just go here on the left and choose connect. Uh, and I want to note this public address and download this configuration file. That'll make sure I have a secure connection so that not just, just anyone can't just connect and try to log into my virtual machine. Now we're gonna run uh, this remote desktop. So click on your windows here, type in remote desktop, and there should be a remote desktop connection app. Now this is installed on all versions of Windows. So if you're doing this at home, you might have to download this, just search for it on at Microsoft and you can set this up. Uh, but our machines have this involved. So here's our uh, connection option and we can connect up to this computer. So open up the dialog box uh, here uh, and uh, let's see. All oh, right, and I'll load it up. Yeah, yeah, I think that's what I wanted to do. Uh, you can open. We want to tie this to that file we downloaded, so I can go into advanced and open up that RDB file here. But an easier way is if I just go into uh, the downloads folder, and here's that. If I double click on that, it'll run. Right. Okay. Oh, it did? Let's see. Right click and edit. Okay, yeah, right click and edit. That'll open it up and it'll put in your computer. Okay, so um, find it in your downloads file, right click and choose edit. And that'll open it up. Uh, it'll list the computer's IP address here. Your login name will be here. And then we can hit connect. And again, this is the first time we're connecting this remote computer. We can just say, OK, connect. Ask me for my password. So I wrote down my password when I was creating this. And I'm going to type in the same password here. Little you know, T Givens one, two, three, four. And it says we can't verify or she want to connect, and we're going to say yes. Uh, generally, there might be some certificate, or you, you know, we're connected to a new machine here. So, and it should open up a window here with our virtual machine uh, here. I'm going to run, so it probably does this full screen. I don't want it in full screen right now, so I'm going to put this in a window so I can see the rest of it. So again, this is uh, my remote desktop into this uh, machine, this server. And I have a command line here where I can type in 
ls dir there for this. Okay, so see if you can get to this point um, and uh, see if you can get connected to your remote, remote machine. If you get this uh, command line, try type in dir to get a directory of your folders that are available there. And then I think we're basically done with this lesson here. We can look at some of the disks and stuff, but I think we're gonna wait on that uh, for that. So if you wanna go through that, you can, but I just wanna get you to this virtual machine here. And I'll come around and help you if you can't get this virtual machine started. <clears throat> 